Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up, how on earth did the big teams let Tadej Pogacar go up the row with 100 k's to go in the Amstel Gold Race? I'll be taking a look at exactly what happened there and how Demi Vollering won the women's. I'll also be recapping Brabant's appeal, the Giro di Sicilia and a trio of one-day races in France. <laughs> This week in the world of racing, we learned that Lorena Vibes is more than just a sprinter. Here she is putting out a gazillion watts at the foot of the Cowberg yesterday. Look at the acceleration of Lorena Vibes out of that corner. Whether or not it helped anyone is up for discussion, but it was mighty impressive either way. We also learned how Mass Pedersen prepared for Paris-Roubaix by motor pacing on the cobbles behind a quad bike. This was from a video released by Trek Racing last week on their YouTube channel entitled Through Hell and Back, All Access, Holy Week, in which Elisa Longo Borghini also features and speaks incredibly eloquently about the race and what it means. And finally, we learned that if today Pogacar is on the start list, there's a very good chance he's going to win. Amstel Gold marked his 11th win this year from just 17 days of racing, and he never really looked like it was going to be in doubt the win. Let's head over to the touchscreen to see exactly how he did it. So let's do a really deep dive into exactly how Pogaccia won the men's Amstel Gold Race. This is the Koitenberg. He's already dropped Ben Healy and he continues with an almighty power to the point where he drops Tom Pitcock. From then he goes solo to the finish to take a magnificent win. Back to you in the set. Is that seriously all you've got? What a knucklehead, man. No, no, I, I have got more. Play nicely. So this is really how the race was won. Here we can see that Tom Peacock and Ben Healy know exactly what Pogacar is about to do. He's got a full glass of Amstel and he attacks. And very quickly Tom Peacock realises that if he tries to keep up with Pogacar at this point, by 9pm he is going to be completely cross-eyed and he will never see Pogacar again. So he goes at his own pace, Pogacar finishes off his attack and takes the win. I should probably get a bit more serious with your analysis, shouldn't I? Uh, right, so here we go then. The first pictures that we saw of the race, 90 kilometres to go, and we've got a very strong group out front. Pogacar is already there. And you're thinking, how on earth has he been let up the row with 90 kilometres to go in this sort of group? Who else have we got there? Well, there are two riders from Groupama FDJ, so they're pretty happy. Coffee is represented as well. Two riders at this point from Jaco Alula, so they're happy as well. We have Gianni Vermeers representing Alpes and de Koenig. Another duo, this time from Ineos Grenadiers, including their leader for the race, Tom Pidcock. Ben Healy for EF Education Easy Post. Cron for Lotto Destiny, probably their best bet at a podium placing here. And one rider from Jumbo Visma, and that is Tosh van der Sander. Now, if you go and look at the Jumbo Visma website and their race report, it says there that Tosh van der Sander initiated the breakaway, which suggests, obviously, that he made the move that pulled that group clear. Maybe the English isn't quite right and actually he infiltrated the breakaway, but if he did make that move and pull Pogacar clear, it was a massive mistake because it put them on the back foot behind. Here you can see Israel, Premier Tech and Uno X starting to chase, but already Ineos Grenadiers with four riders trying to slow the chase down because they have got their leader up the road. So this on the next climb of the day with 85 kilometres to go. And Pogacar, he said in his post-race interview that he didn't intend to go in a group this early in the race and he was surprised. But he's obviously looked around and thought, well, this is going to be a lot safer. I haven't got to fight for position as much going into the corners and the climbs. And so I'm going to make the most of it. So he presses on this time up this climb. And in doing so, he puts a couple of riders out the back. Now, one of the Jayco Alula riders has already been distanced because of a puncture. This is Chris Yule Jensen also being distanced, and this at the back is Tosh van der Sander of Jumbo Visma. So all of a sudden, Jumbo Visma not represented in the front group, and they're going to have to start chasing behind. And it shows Jumbo Visma all of a sudden realizing it's a 40 second gap, and they need to start chasing in earnest. So three riders on the front for them. And if I run that clip through again, you'll notice that Trek Segafredo just here, 
and also Bahrain Victorias are about to come up and aid the chase as well. But unfortunately for all of those teams, the chase is going to be in vain. I also wanted to point this part out. It's something that Brian Smith noticed in commentary and told us about there. He'd noticed that Pogaccio was looking down at his bike, started bouncing up and down on it as though he had a rear wheel puncture. And here we can see him putting his arm up trying to get the team car. Now there aren't any team cars behind because the gap is only 38 seconds and you're not allowed to have team cars in that gap until it goes over the one minute mark. Either way, this is what Pogaccio said about the incident after the race. I was on a sort of flat tire. For, for many cases in the front, and uh, yeah, uh, I was doubting that I could, uh, I could come to the finish solo, but uh, in the end, yeah, I squeezed as much as possible to come to the finish line, and uh, yeah, I made it. Yeah, I was really frustrated because we didn't have cars for so long time, and uh, yeah, then uh, we managed to get the bike uh, just in time to before the final climbs, and uh, yeah, it was really, really tight and uh, really nervous at, the, at one moment. <laughs> Now you might be wondering how his tyre had started to go flat and wasn't completely flat by the time he got his bike change over 30 kilometres later. What I think has happened is that there is sealant inside these tuberous tyres that they are now using. So he probably punctured, it took a little while for the sealant to activate in that time. He lost some pressure, but after that it stayed at the same pressure. Right, so on to the next clip, which is this one. So, Matteo Trentin following an attack from Ida Schelle, and this turns out to be a very intellectual move from the Italian, because finally, Pogaccia finds his team car behind him. I'm not sure entirely how, because the gap is still 22 seconds, so I still don't think that the UAE Team Emirates team car should have been allowed into this gap, especially on such a narrow road. A small gap like that, Trentin and Schelling are going to be coming through soon after, not long after that, we've got the main bunch as well, so it's going to be a bit of a squeeze for them. Either way, you're thinking to yourself, well, this is brilliant. He's got his bike changed, Trenton's going to be able to help him to get back up to the group. But as it turned out, he didn't need the help of anyone whatsoever. He got a big push from the team mechanic and started sprinting. And at this point in the race, you started to think, it's going to be nigh on impossible for anyone else to beat Pogaccia at Amstel Gold today. Trenton's doing his best to get across, but just behind the motorbikes here, you'll see Pogaccia just a handful of seconds off the front of the group and the race. One climb later, and he's been on the front for quite some time at this point, so it's clear to everybody what he's about to do. He goes on the attack. The only riders that can go with him are initially Tom Pidcock, and then soon after, they are joined by Ben Healy of EF Education Easy Post. I want to show you this clip as well. Uh, so this is the lead into the Koitenberg, one of the most decisive parts normally of the Amstel Gold Race. It's really steep, it's a very narrow entry, there's a couple of corners. Normally you have quite a big group going into this point in the race, and so positioning is crucial. But this year it opened up so early, there's just three riders left out front. With 500 metres to the start, Tom Pidcock here has already said, I'm not giving you another turn because I know what's coming up in just a few moments time. I think this is the climb that they go up, that's how steep it is. Fast forward it a little bit longer, Pogaccio just stays on the front through those opening corners and the steep gradients. It's not long before Ben Healy has dropped and further distance here. By this point, Tom Peacock has been glued to the wheel for quite some time. I think the reason he went so deep was because he thought Pogaccio can't possibly sustain this amount of power for this long. And he was hoping that when Pogaccio looked around, saw him still stuck to the wheel, you say, well, I can't get rid of you at this point. We'll have to fight it out later and just slowed things down. As it turned out, Pogaccio had more than enough power to keep pressing on. Tom Pitt got really, really paid for going that deep later on in the race. The final clip that I want to show you is a controversial one. It's just 10 kilometers to go. Now, to give you a bit of an aspect on how things were at this point. Pogaccia had increased his lead to Ben Healy behind, he dropped Tom Pidcock to around about 35 seconds. So Healy has done an incredible job to bring it down by 13 seconds to just 22. And then all of a sudden, the race director's car goes around Pogaccia and doesn't speed off. Now, those are quite truncated shots that we've just shown you, but the car was actually in front of him for quite some time, a good 20 seconds or so, and this is around the next left-hand corner where it still hasn't gone too far into the distance. And you will see how contrasting it is when we go back to Ben Healy, who's got clean air and a clean road in front of him. So he would have to put a lot more power out to go exactly the same speed. Now, I don't think that this made much difference to the end result of the race. Pogaccia almost certainly would still have won, it's just a shame to see that sort of thing happening in a race of this standard.
Anyway, let's move on to the women's now. And these were the first images that we saw from the race. Uh, Lucinda Brand representing Trek Segafredo and Sabrina Stoltins of Live Racing, two very solid riders that you do not want to let too far off the leash. More on them later. But I always want to highlight just how much work throughout the day the European champion Lorena Vives did. And we understand that even before live pictures started, she'd already done an awful lot of work for the SD Works team. It was mightily impressive, even though one of the moves she made I don't think helped her teammates very much at all. More on that later on. I also want to highlight how much Soroya Paladin did for Canyon Sram. Now, her teammate Katia Nuvidoma has got some stupendous results in this race over the years, so she would be the outright leader of that team. I think, though, that Paladin was co-leader and given the opportunity to go up the road earlier on. When she was making these attacks, you could see how much hurt she was putting on. There's some pretty big name riders behind her, but she did so much. And I just wonder, had she done a little bit less, whether she might have got an even better result than she did. Now you can see that the gap in that previous part was over the two minute mark. It's come down to one minute and 26 seconds. SD Works, who aren't represented at the front, haven't done a jot of work on the front as a team. They've just been following moves and contributing that way. However, Movistar, now sent into danger, wanted to work for Annemiek van Fleurten and Liana Lippert, start a concerted chase behind. And they are aided a little bit later on by the AG insurance team, as you will see now working for Ashley Mulman Pascio. So once again, two teams who probably shouldn't be taking responsibility for the race are doing so, and it's allowing SD Works to just keep themselves hidden, saving energy within this group, whilst other teams do the chasing of the two leaders up the road. The next clip is this one, once again highlighting how much work Lorena Vives did in this race. Uh, still got three ascents of the Cowberg to go. She led them into that, she led them up the first part of that climb. But I also want to highlight this. Towards the top of that ascent, we have Mavi Garcia on the front for Live Racing. Now, she wasn't going flat out, and you can see now that she's looking over her shoulder to assess the situation, but given that she had a rider up the road, it just seemed a little bit strange for her to be on the front at all. Paladin, once again on the move with 37.4 kilometers remaining, this time following Grace Brown of FDJ Suez. Again, once again, highlighting just how good Paladin's legs were yesterday. 51 seconds the gap at this point, so they've kind of got it a bit more in hand, and it comes down even further, obviously, later on. 13 seconds with 33 kilometers to go, but still no chasing from the SD Works riders. You can see how cool Volering is looking, likewise for her teammate Lotta Kopecky and Misha Bredevold, who does follow a lot of moves during the race, but the two leaders not having to do anything at all, as you would expect, but I just felt like the whole SD Works team played things really cleverly. Even again here, the gap has gone back up to 34 seconds. Movistar realised the danger, wanting to work for the world champion and Liana Lippert. So they go to the front and begin chasing in earnest again. On the radio there, this wasn't an attack, it's just that the riders behind didn't immediately follow and so a gap started to open up. I want to highlight this part as well. So over here, we have Lotta Kopecky. Now I was thinking, wow, Proper classics rider, disrobing with 25 kilometers still to go, not feeling the rain, not feeling the cold. But as it turned out, she was feeling the cold and she was expecting to get a jacket from her soigneur on the side of the road. When she found out that he didn't have one there, she was not very happy at all. She wanted some extra legs. That's how cold it was yesterday. I think a lot of the riders felt it very badly and probably a lot of them didn't have the legs they were expecting to because of that cold weather. A few comments later, she's back at the team car using a bit of energy to get the extra jacket that she needed. The penultimate ascent of the Cowper. This is once again Lorena Vives. She's led them down the last part of the descent so quickly she's already got a gap and that gap only increases on this corner due to her bike handling skills. She then sprints pretty much flat out. Now she's the best sprinter in the women's peloton so of course if she goes this hard she is going to create a gap over those behind her. And so from that point of view, I'm not really sure how this serves the SD Works team. Nobody's following. Lots of Kopecky's just watching her teammate go up the road. Normally, if you're in this situation and you want to make things hard, you need to make sure that the rest of the group is behind you, that it strings things out, and therefore that your very strong team leaders can attack off the back of that. As it was, she went so hard for so long that even when she ran out of energy and parked it on the side of the road, she had a huge gap 
By the time she was caught by the group behind, she'd had a chance to recover, and as you'll see in a few moments' time, when they got over the top of the cowberg, she was still right up there towards the front. Now, in part, I'll pause that, you can see her over here. In part, that's because there were no attacks from the main group this time up the climb, but still impressive to do that sort of lead out at the foot of the climb and still be there in the group going over the top. Kristen Faulkner of Jaco Alula is the next to go on the attack. We all know how strong she is from what she did last year from Strada Bianca this year. Who is the person that chases her down? It's that person again, Lorena Vibes. But she goes so fast through the corners with her skill that she's actually got separation between herself and the peloton behind. So she kind of chases it down, but at the same time, she's not bringing the group and therefore her teammates back because of how good she is in the corners. Also wanted to highlight here, Kristen Faulkner has been caught by the main group and favourites behind, looks around, sees them there, and yet still stays on the front for quite some time after this clip ends. I think she should just go back, sit in, save it for another attack potentially later on. Paladin, once again on the move for Canyon Strand with 15 kilometres to go, and she'd be solo for quite some time. It wasn't until 7.8 kilometres to go that Grace Brown makes yet another move, and eventually the two join up at the front. But this, finally, is where SD Works are doing some work to chase down this break for the two leaders in the race. You can see them on the front, and they really need to do this to make sure that the gap doesn't get out of hand. So, on to the final climb then. You can see Paladin and Brown have a bit of an advantage over the rest. Paladin once again demonstrating just how good she was on the day. She's only caught towards the top. Uh, this is Liana Lippert, the German champion on the left-hand side. If you look further down, Kopecky in the saddle for SD Works, looking cool, calm and collected. Then five for Georgie. Then Demi Vollering, the eventual winner, is actually quite a long way down. So neither of the two SD Works leaders actually go on the attack on the climb of the Kalberg itself. But once we get over towards the top of the climb, I want you to take a look at this. Just a few moments time, watch Kopecky, watch Vollering. There's a glance round from the Belgian to the Dutch woman, a knowing nod, and then she goes. In almost exactly the same place where Marta Cavalli went this time last year. It is the perfect place to go because all those riders have gone deep into the red, made a huge effort up the climb, and they probably don't have the legs to respond to anything. Vollering, knowing that she still had enough energy to go on the attack, chose the perfect moment to make her move and was never seen again. And what was nice was that there was a proper embrace this time from Kopecky and Vollering, not quite the same as the atmosphere at the end of Strade Bianche. And according to Jose Ben on Twitter, overhearing what was said, Vollering said to Kopecky, I love you. How nice is that? So, Vollering and Pugaccia take their first career wins at Amstel Gold, and both will be looking to add flesh wallon to their palmares on Wednesday. Back to the Amstel beer on the podium, though, and whilst it looks like a clear win for Pugaccia, I'm not sure he took the KOM. <laughs> We will keep you updated on that KOM in the coming years. Uh, given Pogaccia's lack of experience at the Amstel Gold Race though, you do wonder how he knew exactly where was best to attack. Thankfully, he told us the answer to that in his interview. Matthew van der Poel told me that I should go on Kjotenberg and uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, it, it is the most hard climb and uh, most, uh, it suits, suits me the most. When did he told you uh, that? When did he tell you? Uh, three days ago. <laughs> Yeah. Sent you a message or did he ring you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. send me a message. Yeah. And you sent him a message back right now, or? Yeah, of course. I will. Uh, I will thank him for advice. <laughs> Must be nice having friends in high places in the bunch. Although I do wonder what Thunderpool's Alpes and De Kerning teammates think about him giving tips to his rivals. Not that they would have been able to do much about it anyway. Uh, either way, Pogaccia did not take Van der Poel's KOM on that climb. In fact, he was 18 seconds slower than the Dutchman was when he won the race back in 2019. Uh, on now to what we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week, and since it's our Den week, the main focus will be on Wednesday and Sunday. Taking place on the former, Flesh Wallon, 
a race that generally all comes down to the final ascent of the Mur de Huy, with Anna van der Breggen and Alejandro Valverde taking the win at the end of it. However, with both of those riders now retired and the more recent winners not looking on top form, there's a strong likelihood we'll get some new additions to the list of race winners. Uh, then on Sunday, it's the oldest classic of them all, Liège Baston Liège. Vollering will start as the clear favourite in the women's given recent form, but with Avonapol back to defend his title, Pogaccia might not have it all his own way in the men's. That is going to be a very interesting battle if they're both in good shape and don't suffer any bad luck. Uh, speaking of La Doyenne, you may have noticed that I am sporting this t-shirt dedicated to it, the Queen of the Classics. Uh, if you'd like to get your hands on one, simply head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com where you'll find our complete classics collection, as well as two brand new t-shirts for the Stelvio and Mortarolo climbs in Italy. Ahead of both of the Ardennes races this week though, we have got the start of the Tour of the Alps. It's a five day race that some Giro d'Italia contenders are using as their final tune up ahead of the Giro d'Italia in May. Uh, Ineos Grenadiers in fact send almost their entire Giro lineup there, including GC leaders Thomas, Gegenhardt, Allensman and Sivakov. They'll be up against the likes of Vlasov, Carthy, Butrago, Hay, Kemner and Pozzovivo for the overall classification. Territory restrictions do apply to all of the races that I've just mentioned, so please check what is available where you are. Next week, meanwhile, we'll have the Tour de Romandie, and soon after that, it will be time for the first Grand Tour of the season, the Giro d'Italia. A race that all GCN Plus subscribers will be able to watch, as there are no territory restrictions whatsoever. So if you're not already subscribed, make sure you do so before then. We'd love to have your company for what is sure to be three glorious weeks of racing around Italy. Meanwhile, on the World of Cycling this Wednesday, I will be joined by Andy McGrath and Elena Bagstedt to talk about stars in the making, whilst our documentary this week is called Checkpoint Barcelona. It features Alec Briggs and Juan Antonio Flesher, and the two compete against each other to reach as many checkpoints in Barcelona as they can in two hours. They've just got a map, a bike, and a Polaroid camera. Here's a trailer for you. I'm Alec Briggs. Crit rider and creator of Team Tekken. I'm heading to the Catalonian capital, Barcelona, for a street race like no other. And my opponent, me, Juan Antonio Flecha. I'm a former pro rider with one Tour de France stage victory and eight Paris Roubaix top tens. Woo! This is the ultimate checkpoint challenge. Two hours to hit designated landmarks. Collecting the most points possible in a scramble around the city. I prefer a test of strategy. I'm gonna definitely go for the one on the outside first. Maybe I can just link something together and wing it and pull it off. Oh, I don't know, man. Speed. Fabian Bucket Red Hook Crit Barcelona. And Urban Savviness. Oh, yeah, kitty, 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 kitty. That documentary will be available for all GCN Plus subscribers to watch from tomorrow. On to the other races from last week now, and I'll start with Wednesday's Brabant's appeal. In the women's, some questionable tactics from SD Works put Silvia Persico in with a chance of winning, and she didn't need a second invitation. She comfortably beat Vollering in the sprints of the line with Lippert in third. In the men's, Remy Cavagna made the move that would ultimately pull a strong group clear. The strongest within it turned out to be Ben Healy and Dorian Godon, who would sprint between them for the win. Despite sitting on for the final two kilometres, Healy could do nothing when Godon kicked for the line, the Frenchman taking the biggest win of his career so far there. In France, we had three back-to-back one-day races, the first of which was the Grand Prix Besançon Doubs. 19-year-old Lenny Martinez did his utmost to shake Victor Le Fay off his wheel on the climb to the finish, but the confidence rider showed no signs of cracking and easily won the sprint at the top of that final climb. One day later, in some pretty awful weather conditions, it was the Tour de Jura. Lafay again in the mix on the summit finish, but didn't quite have the strength to go with the best. The best on the day was Kevin Vaucolin, who many are touting as the future of French cycling. The 21-year-old made his move with a couple of kilometres still remaining, leaving some really big names in his wake. Thibaut Pino finished second on the day, Guillaume Martin third. And that's the third win of the season for Vaucolin. A real talent, and it's a shame actually that it doesn't look like he's set to do Liège Baston Liège on Sunday, if only to get experience. And finally, we had the Tour de Doubs yesterday. A small group contested the victory, with Pino once again having to settle for second, this time behind Hades Harada, who took his second win of the season and the tenth for Kofidis.
Down in Italy, we had the four-day Giro di Sicilia. Uh, stage one marked the first pro win for young Finn Fisher Black. New Zealander had sit out almost all of 2022 through injury, but given his performance that day and over the whole race, I think it's safe to say we're going to see a lot more of him in the near future. Uh, the only sprint stage came 24 hours later, Niccolo Bonifacio taking his first win in 10 months there, ahead of Albanese, whilst Joel Suter gave Tudor Pro Cycling another big win on stage three. He did incredibly well to hold off the chase behind, finishing four seconds ahead of the disappointed sprinters there. The GC, though, all came down to the final day. Rafael Maika and Finn Fischer-Black did their best to limit the advantage of a strong front group on the final climb, but Alexei Lutschenko had brilliant legs on the day, going clear of his breakaway companions and soloing to the finish line. And in maintaining enough of an advantage to also take the GC, it gave Astana their second and third victories of the season so far. Louis Mainkies launched himself up 13 places on GC that day to take second on the podium, whilst bonus seconds in taking third for Albanese also launched him up to third place on the GC. In other news, ASO revealed the wildcard teams for the Tour de France fam avec Zwift last week. Co-op Hitech, AG Insurance and three French squads uh, got themselves wildcards for the race, they being Saint-Michel, Cofidis and Arkea. They'll all be lining up in Clermont-Ferrand for the start of the race on the 23rd of July. Lizzie Dignan, former winner of Liège Baston Liège, is rumoured to be making her competitive return for Trek Segafredo this week. It's still unconfirmed, but rumours were flying about last week that she might start racing at Flesh Wallon on Wednesday, which is ahead of her scheduled return, which was supposed to be at La Vuelta Feminas at the start of May. Christophe Laporte has signed a new three-year contract with Jumbo Visma, despite lucrative offers from elsewhere, and there's also been a three-year extension for Surin Varenschgold at Uno X. And finally, Sana Kant returned home from hospital last week, where she will continue her recovery from the facial wounds that she sustained at Paris-Roubaix Femme Avex Wift. Right, that is all for this week. Enjoy the racing. I'll see you again on the World of Cycling this Wednesday.